Hello, hi Emily. Hello, how are you doing? I'm all right, just a bit computer eyed. Uh, have you been on the computer all day? Um, yeah, I try and do everything in one day and then have a day off. Oh, that's I good. To do yeah. Artwork. So, yeah, lots of um, on demand online workshops and meeting with people and supporting people. Oh, thank you, Diana, for doing this. It's so. Oh, thank you for asking. It's really, really, really nice to see you and chat to you. Hey, I love the um, life drawing show. Oh, I'm glad you watched it. <laughs> you know, I thought, I thought obviously it would be good, but I actually, it felt so just nice to do a life drawing class. And it just, yeah, it felt like being in an actual class. Because we did the first one in February mm. and it went down really well because it's BBC Four, late at night, people are working and the BBC went, let's just do another one. It's mm. not a better time to do it. So it's yeah. really good. I mean, we had was it 26 and a half thousand submissions, drawings coming in. So I was just like, oh my God, how am I going to talk about all of this? So yeah, I mean, live TV is very hard, but um, the ratings were massive. Number one on Twitter that night. So it was brilliant to reach out to people and you know kids everyone joining in yeah. and I think the more online art stuff we do creativity is huge now in this lockdown so yeah. fingers crossed at the end of this the government realized we need art courses well, we yeah. need that creativity it's not a soft subject no it's what everybody almost everybody has fallen back on fallen back on in some way shape or form yeah it's crafting creativity all these things but what I liked about it as well is that you know we're obviously all using our living room so much at the minute mm. and I like the way it just transformed the living room into an art space just for like two hours that evening it was brilliant yeah and it goes to show you don't need to spend money on doing art you don't need a massive big studio you don't need a palette you know everything's very homemade so that's what I'm promoting online you know very doable things at home mm. but a lot of my work I used to do was based on food yeah, when I went to uni. I couldn't afford oil paints, but mum gave me a pot of spices. I went, you know what? I'm going to paint with that, and it worked. Brilliant! So um, accessible. I wrote an article a while back, while back for um, the Guardian Teacher Network, and that was one of the big things I said. And and I said exactly that. You know, artists throughout the ages have been poor, and they've had to just use backs of doors and cardboard boxes and things. You know, you yeah. Don't... Could you send me that article? Yeah, I'll send it to you. Yeah, yeah. that'd be great. So I'm collecting yeah. loads of resources for um, well, different universities who are finding it difficult to teach online. Mm. Um, so I'm at Loughborough University at the moment and they're finding it difficult because we are basically going online come October if right. the students enrol. And I'm saying, you know, we could do PowerPoints, you know, Zoom, all sorts of different things. It's very accessible. Mm. And as visual artists, like you said, you know, artists get inventive mm. and work with what they have. Exactly. It's actually this this limitation limitations are perfect setting for creativity, aren't they? Yeah. It's 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 what creatives enjoy and thrive on, kind of. But exactly. the other thing particularly about the life drawing class that really struck me as well is that I got you know that zone that you get into as an artist, and I really got into that kind of you know it was two hours, so it was long enough for me to get into that kind of flow. And I think for some people who aren't artists or don't normally do that sort of thing, they would have experienced that maybe for the first time, that calmness, that loss of, you know, everything else, just the drawing. It was brilliant. Really. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you haven't got a school teacher looking over you. And that's yeah. something that puts people off. Yeah. You know, that right or wrong answer. There isn't one. It's having a go. Exactly. And because of the other side of your brain. Now, and obviously Grayson's fantastic programme and yeah. everyone's just, you know, everyone's work has value because it's valuable to you and it's you know anyway we've jumped way ahead of everything <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so I first saw you on the big painting challenge and I just I just I just because obviously I'm a teacher as well and I've taught secondary and primary for about 20 years now and I just really appreciated your approach to teaching because I found you very direct and clear but not you weren't over praising or anything like that which oh, thank you like i really resonated with my teaching style because obviously I, I teach in primary schools quite a lot and i really like that approach because even with little kids you don't have to be overly gushy you can be yeah you know 
Um, they want the honesty, they want simplicity. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that's what really just, I just really, you know, you caught my attention in that show for that directness. And I just thought, fantastic. Oh, thank you. It's editing. So the scary thing is you don't have control on your personality. Yeah. Something like 500 hours, 500 hours of footage yeah. condensed into 58 minutes. So that was a scary thing. I mean, I'm not a TV person. I got asked to do this by BBC producer who phoned me up one day. I went, I've been following you work for a while. And I went, who is this? And I went, do you want to be on this programme? I went, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's been a fantastic platform. I don't want to be a TV star. But what's been brilliant is I have builders coming up to me and saying, I've got acrylics for Christmas. I'm going to use them now. Oh. There are all sorts of people that are almost embarrassed about doing painting in the evening after their normal job. Yeah. You know, so it's been you get that feeling and you felt that feeling of flow and all the rest of it. You just want it again and you just have to go back there and you have to have more of it, don't you? Yeah, and, yeah. I don't know what I'd do without it. Oh, I know. I know. Um, could you just, before we get into this, so much I want to talk to you about, because I know that you do so much in education and advocacy and stuff as well. But could you talk to me a bit about how you got into art when you were younger? Yeah, so... Um... Well, I was born in this country and then um, my dad took us all to live back in Bangladesh when I was two till six years old. Um, and Bang Bengali is my first language. So coming back to this country, my dad stuck me in nursery school and I was six and I was going, what the hell is everyone talking about? And in Bangladesh, because it's monsoon season, I used to just sit there and play with mud. I was too young to go to school in Bangladesh, so I've never really had education. Um, but yeah, I used to play with mud all the time, getting my hands dirty, making mud cakes. And when I came back, um, it was a school teacher that said to all the kids, right, paint a rainbow, paint your house. And I'm going, what the hell's a rainbow? <laughs> so I just got black paint and just smeared it all over the paper because it reminded me of mud and that's all I knew. And then looking back, it was, I was just thinking, God, that's frustration. Mm -hmm. It was just black piece. And that was, I mean, talk about conceptual art. Yeah. Um, but that was frustration for me because I couldn't say it in English. Yeah. And since then, art has always been a voice for me. When you can't say it verbally, do it through the artwork because you can't articulate it. An important thing as well with just assumptions that teachers make or that people make. Like, you know, you'd, you'd never, you wouldn't know what a rainbow is. Why would you have known it? And we just make yeah. all these assumptions, when we, especially in teaching. I remember having a similar thing talking about a meadow with a child and sort of reading their face and thinking, hang on, this child doesn't know what I'm on about. Because yeah. why would they know what a meadow is when we're in inner London, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So since then, art has always been my voice when you can't say it verbally. Do it through pictures, do it through images. Yeah. Do it through the tool yeah, that you're really really young. And then how did that kind of, did you, in your primary setting, was that nurtured, that? Um, not really. It was the early 80s, so teachers didn't really know how to relate to me. And also, I didn't know how to communicate with them. Mm -hmm. But every subject I did, I drew things rather than write it. And, and I thought, OK, when, when people say I've always been interested in art since I was a kid, it's true. Mm -hmm. It's there in your head as from communication. So through school, I um, wasn't really supported. My parents didn't get it, but I knew I had a subject to hold on to. Mm -hmm. um, and then that went on to um, secondary school, my A-levels, um, doing a degree, uh, master's. It was art, that was my voice. Yeah. And uh, I, mean, I mean, I've been made redundant, I'm more FE and more um, HE now. I've been made redundant so many times because the managers don't get the arts. Mm. And you know, as you know, the more you get into our education, it's philosophy, it's theology, it's all mm. sorts of, you know, it's a hard subject. Yeah. Um, so what I like to do now is um, use art as that form of communication through different workshops with people that can't speak English, men and women that have been through domestic violence, kids that have been kicked out of school because it's a universal thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've always pursue, pursued it, not really knowing how to do it. Yeah. I knew it was there. It was an expression, yeah, a form of expression. Yeah. Do you think, do you find then that there's a crossover sometimes between, because I've often found that when I'm doing a certain type of teaching or teaching a certain type of project in schools, because I've, I've been more sort of formally in schools as a teacher part-time, um, that there is kind of, the, it crosses over into art therapy sometimes. And as a teacher, you have to be quite wary of that in a school setting. Do you ever Sometimes. I don't like to use the word art therapy because I think it's more communication. So when I've done workshops in primary schools, you have the teachers going, oh, you're on my territory. But I let the kids, I love them to just there, speak and then tailor that one-to-one -one into, okay, how can we 
communicate this. Mm. So yeah, it's, it is a kind of therapy, but it's more about um, a voice. Mm. Whether that's we all need to express what's inside, whether or not it borders into therapy or not, it doesn't matter, does it? I guess. Yeah, whether that's anger or frustration, like to me, it was my frustration. Yeah. You know, having that message. Yeah. And did you have formal sort of technical art training as well in your in your studies in your? Uh, well, I did fine art degree, um, so it's very self motivated. Yeah. Um, and then my MA was um, contemporary fine art, mm -hmm. and yeah, technical in terms of how to do things, how to paint, how to draw. But a lot of it was self taught. Mm -hmm. um, but what I loved about art education is how to actually get that voice across, how to communicate what's going on with events around you, what's going on with society, what's going on with ecology, environment. Mm. So it's being able to put those skills, the technical skills into creativity, mm. and into context. Mm. And, you know, and I love that sort of education where you can actually speak with peers and go, okay, with art, you can get away with it. You know, if we have a voice as an artist, who listens? But you can do it through your artwork. Mm. And, you know, I work for AN um, on the Artist Council, you know, advocating um, artists to have a voice and make that change. So, if anything, art education gives you that step ladder to actually do something about it and share it, communicate with it. So, you can't <laughs> just keep it to yourself. No, exactly. And, it, and you're right, you said something there about it being different. Art is different. And I think in the primary setting, that is something that's quite, um, it's quite a challenge to get that across because primary schools, as you know, they're quite, uh, they can be quite rigid environments, sometimes with good reason because it's to keep the children safe, etc. But I, what I'm trying to, and I guess part of the, these interviews and chats I'm doing with artists, it's because I work a lot with primary school teachers who, as you know, aren't necessarily art specialists, but they get given responsibility for the subject. And I just want to make sure that, especially as we come into a time now where primary schools are paying a bit more attention to art because there have been some government changes and inspections, but to keep art as a subject that can be brave, that can be different, because otherwise there's danger of it slipping into another one of those very... Soft courses. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, what do, what do you think about in terms of primary school art? I know that might not be your specialist area, but content of an art curriculum in primary school, um, should it be linked to history? Should it be linked to topic? Should it be? Yeah, I think art is one of the subjects that you can bring in every other subject into it. It is, you know, it's such a welcoming subject. Yeah. Um, and I think everything else has a right or wrong answer. And I think the way it can be taught is, okay, let's look at your heritage or let's look at your race. Look at other artists that deal with that subject. Look at other artists that deal with mental health or poverty. Because you can always find an artist, whether it's from history or recent times, that will communicate those particular issues. So the kids don't need to feel they're alone. Is it okay to have these problems? Yes, because this artist has done it this way. So look at them. So I think it's really relatable to society, to mental health, to the wider issues we have. Yeah. So I think, yeah, there are techniques, there are certain ways, but I think the, the children need to actually realise it's okay to say this mm. because it has been done and you're not the only one. Yeah. So that sense of um, validation. Welcomed, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. And I don't think school teachers need to be scared of that. Yeah, there's a um, lot of issues that, you know, you can't talk about, but we should be able to through art. There's a way of saying it. There's a way of teaching it. Mm. But it has been done. Yeah. And I think this time now, this lockdown time, is a time where we've all, like we said at the start, realised the humanness of all of us and creativity is part of that humanness and so is talking and feeling is part of that. So, yeah, I totally agree with what you're saying and I hope that when we go back to schools that we can, I don't know, just support schools a bit more with helping them to feel... Yeah, yeah, I mean... I'm always um, helping people, especially in education. And, you know, I am going to um, email. I mean, I've tried to anyway, with, um, I mean, Nottingham at the moment saying, if you need any art help, yeah, I to do it. Because I can't just sit there commenting. You need to be practical and pragmatic about it. I mean, there's a lot of um, work set procedures, you know, God bless the teachers that are doing massive big work. Um, but they're not necessarily giving art activities. No. You know, a lot of my neighbours, I'm throwing paints in their garden going, have a go at this, have a go at that, you know, get away from the Master of Science for a minute. <laughs> 
And uh, <laughs> break. yeah, I did a, um, I've been trying to do some short videos for home art learning. And I did, I did like- I saw a couple of those. Yeah, yeah. the cover mix and things. Yeah, they were good. I did a few of them. And then I suddenly thought, I suddenly felt this like, had this nagging feeling that, oh my goodness, you know, this kind of disparity between the fact that some families will be like getting the paints out and, you know, looking at old family history pictures and doing all this amazing enriching stuff. And there'll be some parents that don't have that confidence. Yeah. And yeah. one of the things I focused it on was that thing of talking about your family history and heritage. Because I, what I said in the post is that a lot of my friends who are children of immigrants, for some reason, our parents don't pass that history on as much yeah. as some others. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's, uh, I just found that, you know, this is a time when children are at home with their parents and I want parents to feel like, yeah, you know, go off grid, ditch the timetable for a couple of days. Exactly, exactly. And that's what I want to get across as well. And um, especially with um, Asian parents, they won't know how to do it. I never had the support from her parents, not because they weren't supportive, but because they didn't know how to. Yeah. Um, and default to the schools so much. They default to the the ex, uh, expertise of teachers, but parents all have expertise in them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my dad, um, when he lost his job, um, he had many heart attacks when he was young. But he also used to be a gardener, and I remember being in the garden and making sculptures out of hose pipes. Mm -hmm. It's still creativity. So creativity doesn't come through paint, charcoal, all those traditional art materials. It could be cooking with your mum. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's still inventiveness and that creativity. Playing. Playing, experimenting and playing. But I mean, that's one of the things that's come up a few times in these chats. And it's that thing of teachers, I think maybe from the culture of being observed and having yeah. people popping in. You know, if you walk into a class and they're all sat there playing with mud or whatever, yeah. it's that fear of, oh, this doesn't look. Oh, yeah. The amount of times I've been observed where you have the tick box. Yeah. And you get observed by other subject yeah. management. Yeah. You don't get it. Mm. So, okay, how they're learning. Look what they're doing, you know. And you almost have to change your lesson. I refuse to do that in the end. Maybe that's why I got made redundant. <laughs> <laughs> because I broke the rules. But the kids were learning. Yeah. You know, and these are adults, you know, they're 18 plus, um, especially in um, further education, A-levels and B-techs. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't conform to the rules. And I think there's also the syllabus, the curriculum. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of um, red tape, isn't there? It says creativity needs to be this way. No, I think you need to be a practitioner and then bring that practice into the education system. Yeah. Just follow the education system. Yeah, there has to be that crossover with, with art and probably other subjects, but obviously that is our subject area, so we know about that. But yeah, I, I've just, just before lockdown, I started... I was about to start some work with Tate Schools because you oh, know okay. they did the um, Steve McQueen. Yeah, yeah. So popular and they had like unprecedented amount of children, primary school children coming into the gallery. But I've been having a lot of conversations with them about how there is this kind of, and I think that's where I see myself and maybe where you are sometimes as a kind of buffer between worlds. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm loving it at the moment because it's not, you can be very lonely in the art world and, you know, have beef and talk about um, what's going on in the world with other artists. And because of the programme, I've been working with lots of different businesses now. Mm. So the Institute of Mental Health at Nottingham University, KPMG, um, different councils about creativity in the workplace. Mm, that's fantastic. Yeah. So it's just like, it's not just about art. Um, so a lot of these businesses are saying, how do our workers get creative in the workplace to engage and to enhance performance? Because they do feel like they're robots. It's nine to five, they're on a computer. And another beef I've got with the government, don't stop art courses, don't stop creative courses because we don't want a generation where you can't think creatively or think outside of the box. That's where the be best ideas happen outside of that box. You think it's because I sometimes wonder if the people who make those sorts of decisions have just forgotten what it feels like to create, you know, their lives on a certain trajectory. Yeah. And, and it's that whole stigma of how can you make money from art? Mm. And I do professional practice talks and I go, if anyone says to you, you can't make it as an artist, don't believe them. Because yeah. I've done it. Yeah. And, you know, it's taken a while, but I've bloody enjoyed the journey. But I do these um, workshops and businesses. You've got these 
suited up guys that are just playing with charcoal. Oh my God, they are loving it. Yeah. And, you know, it's great to see. It's, 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 it's so much, because I'm, I'm quite into, I'm such a sort of cliche, but I'm quite into yoga and meditation as well and well-being. And it just goes like that, doesn't it? You can't separate the two. It is, it, when you see someone, I, in schools I'd often work with the teaching assistants because they come with the class. Yeah. And they would come in sort of when I first start teaching at a school and they'd be like, oh no, I don't, I'm not going to get involved. They'd literally, the body language would be like that. Be like, yeah. you know, and towards the end, you just see them start bringing in their own sketchbooks. <laughs> so they'd hide their sketchbooks in my classroom. Wow. Yeah, That's, it's, it's nothing to be scared of. So if you just give people just a little bit of light going, don't be embarrassed, you know, it's a bit of charcoal, go home. You don't have to tell anyone about it. Just have yeah. a go. And suddenly they're going, oh, <laughs> wow. How do you, how do you ev evidence that? Because there are people who need, who have that need for seeing sort of concrete evidence of, of the benefit of creativity. How do you that's a yeah um well how can you evidence that i mean i work for an you can um do blogs you can do your website you can you have that online presence i mean thank you for this interview i've had quite a few now from different organizations yeah. which is brilliant and it is social media they go okay without sounding egotistical it's like bloody hell what else you could, if you're not going to do it in lockdown when can you do it exactly, yeah. to evidence that um i mean I, ultimately, I'd love to go to Parliament and just go bring back the arts courses, but I need that evidence. And that's why it's good work for AN yeah. um, and work with other artists. But sometimes it feels like, okay, the job is done, but where will it go? Yeah, yeah. So, and I think that, again, lockdown is, it is evidence in itself, isn't it? Like we said, the fact that the popularity of your show, Grace and Perry's show, all these things, people posting that they've, you know, decorated things, and that is... Yeah got to be evidence yeah and i've always said lockdown i hope we learn something from this mm. i really hope we do um um the guy from downtown abbey was on radio 4 today going the arts are going to struggle because like the globe theater they've got no money because they've not had the ticket sales but people have been doing stuff from home so it's that where do we take all of this creativity that we've been doing more than ever yeah. for five years who do we take it to yeah where can it go and how do we stop you know, obviously things aren't going to suddenly go back to normal if they do ever go back to how they were before. But how do we stop, you know, hold the reins and not just want to jump back to, oh, we can do this now again. And, you know, just really be thoughtful about how we go back to things and what we want to keep, what we want to get rid of, you know. But I just, yeah. I think momentum, momentum is building up in terms of creativity because families um, especially single parents who I'm teaching online, um, are going, oh yeah, my kid's calm now. Yeah. Is that okay? It's not about the academic subject, so hold on to that. So, you know, when the child goes back to school, let them just play in their sketchbooks, you know, they probably won't want them to paint on the wall, but just let them have that creativity. Yeah. Play in the garden, you know, get a bit of mud or something. Yeah. And I am. Calmness I hopefully will be sustained. Like having a, like a book, that isn't part of the whole school, you know, um, needs to be in a certain way and just a doodle book that the kids can just yeah. doodle on in whenever they need to. But it's just, you know, these things, people do pay lip service to them, but it's getting them to actually go. This is just as important as, you know, maths and English, for example, to, yeah. and to really, really believe it because people say it or they have a week of art, they do, you know, token things, but... Yeah, and I think that as soon as a school teacher sets it, it becomes a chore. Mm, yeah. So it'd be great to have, ex I mean, even calling it an exercise becomes a chore. Yeah. But have half an hour where you're just playing. Yeah. With whatever you have, get your hands dirty. Mm. So it doesn't become a to-do list. How do you approach grading work when you're teaching? You know, a lot of the questions I get asked by primary school teachers are about how yeah. do you make progress? Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's a reason we have a, cr a criteria, whether that's um, assessing BA, mm. degrees, masters, um, A levels, B techs. There always has to be a criteria so you're not subjective. Yeah. You know, you get a lot of people saying, "Well, how can you mark out? It's subjective." It's not, because you have rules: how to paint, how to draw, how to use this. So it is very objective. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then once you have those rules, that's how you mark it. And then subjectivity. I mean, a lot of the criteria is talks about personal creativity. How has that person, how has that student or pupil 
demonstrated creativity. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to judge that art is subjective, but it's not because the criteria fits in. Yeah. Personal development, creativity, um, inventiveness, mm -hmm. plus technical skills. So you can't have technical skills without the creativity. Yeah. So the objective and the subjective is there. And you do get some people, children, who are, the technical skills are there, but they, the creativity and thinking outside of the box isn't so much there. And that, and I think a lot of the perception in school sometimes can be that, well, they are the standard. The standard. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but I, you know, I, I, one of my favourite photographs from when I was teaching is a, a, a bunch of those, you know, the coil pots. And yeah, they've, yeah, yeah. And they've all done the same one and then one boy has done one with sort of legs and arms sticking out of the top of the pot and it's like well that he's the one yeah you know yeah and um uh, yeah again going back to a criteria of the syllabus um i think with i mean many art courses they do have that technicality but individual personality mm. coming the two together but it, again it is just so different to the other subjects because what other subject does that count really okay. it doesn't it doesn't, like I said, it's a very clean tunnel vision path with other subjects. I'm being completely biased here. Um, but if you look at, um, you know, even science, they have the diagrams. And that's how I got through academic subjects, by drawing it, mm. rather than doing a whole essay. Yeah. How were you with academic? Were you balanced in both or did you? I, I was actually, because I said to myself, but I didn't know English and I didn't know uh, what anyone was saying. I was like, one day I'm going to be top of the class for English so I could actually just shout back yeah. and yeah i did yeah. so yeah in terms of um english yeah top yeah. class math um <laughs> but yeah english um english language english literature yeah academic wise yeah mm -hmm. and i think as artists we are our business person yeah we have to do everything else so many transferable skills mm -hmm. you know online presence writing your own reports evaluations you know, um, I've done a master, so it's all about philosophy. So, you know, you have to be academic yeah. as well as the making of the work. They go hand in hand. Because there's the cliche, isn't there, of that, you know, artists being a certain way and academic people being a certain way. And I think in school, I've, done, I've heard it so much, you know, I've had teachers come up to me and say, well, you know, so-and-so, she's not very academic. Do you think we could get her into some extra art stuff? And I get that. Yeah. I get it, but also part of me thinks, well, why? Maybe she can be both, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, because um, as you go into art education, it's really academic because you're researching, looking at research methodologies, looking at philosophy, looking at so many different um, subjects to get your point across, other than the making. It's almost like the making comes last. Mm -hmm. It's about contextualising. And contextualising, you need to know your art history, you need to know history, you need to know um, politics, um, especially with contemporary art. It's about knowing the world. It's about reading papers. It's about looking at texts. And so, yeah, art is so academic, mm. more, more academic than other subjects because you're looking at so many different... So many, pulling in so many different yeah. strands, yeah. yeah. Almost, do you think there's almost like a different... Like, creativity is almost one subject on its own and art is almost like a whole other subject. Yeah, I see art as the, the making side, that's what drives you. The creativity is how you unpack mm. the artwork. How do you unpack what you're doing? What is it for? What's the reason? Who has done it before? Mm. You know, I teach a lot of degree students and it's so much about context. Yeah, and the creativity side of things, that kind of, that's the bit which is really enriching for everybody in their day-to-day -day lives, whether they're an office worker in a suit or whatever, that's that's kind of the bit that can really actually enhance other subjects, isn't it, in a way? Yeah, again, it's that unpacking and not just looking at what one person said, the other person said, it's looking at four different sides of a story. Yeah. And that critical thinking, mm. that critical thinking, you can't just have an opinion mm. based on nothing. You yeah. know, you need opinions from Daily Mirror, The Guardian, The Independent, Express, yeah. Have all those I mean that's creative reading yeah. so creativity comes into how you live your daily life mm -hmm. it's almost like when you go to a shop oh do I want this brand or that brand you look at all sorts of different yeah. sides because you have that creative thinking and then decide it being discerning it's very complex when people say oh artists do this no it's so complex and very hard to teach yeah it is because there's so much I mean it could literally when I design curriculum for school curricula for school it literally drives you insane because there's yeah. so much to squash in there 
and you want to give students the chance to explore and explore medium and all the rest of it but you also want them to have you know be able to read paintings and it's so, there's so much there is so much it's not an easy subject at no, all no um, and that's why i feel academic because I am researching constantly. I can never say, oh, I'm at the top of my game. Never, because there's always so much to learn. Yeah. You know, from peers, from history, from what's going on now. And, you know, that includes the art market, the business side, um, so many different topics involved in the arts. It is such a complex business, if you like. Yeah. And the thing about, you know, in schools, primary and secondary, is trying to give them that idea that art, like you said, the business side, it's not just this there's a there's a whole world and business connected and linked to art you know um, yeah sometimes it's even about the art <laughs> exactly exactly it's not about making a pretty picture it's so multi-layered mm. and um you know there's a lot of schools go and a lot of parents say well what are the jobs in art oh my god there's so many i mean as you know i've said to my managers well who designed your car who made the suit that you wore yeah. That was one of my last interviews when I got made redundant. It's creative <laughs> people, bye then. <laughs> so where would you be without us? <laughs> yeah. But I don't know, but for some reason people still just, they know that intellectually, but they still just can't conceive of, uh, maybe it's a taking things for granted thing, I don't know. But maybe, it's but also maybe it's about moving through the system quickly mm. and logically. Mm. With art, you have obstacles in your way and you have to go with those. Yeah, I, mean, I, I curate um, international exhibitions, but a lot of the themes that I do for call-outs are based on problems that I see in the world, or problems that I'm having with my own artwork. Mm. So curating is an extension mm. um, of those things. Um, so for example, my father passed away, um, let's say three years ago now, um, and it, the exhibition was called Loss and Lucidity. Mm. And because I couldn't say it verbally, um, and rather than having a counsellor, I said, okay, I'm not the only person that's lost a father. Um, so I opened it out and I had 200 submissions mm -hmm. to do this exhibition because it resonated with people. Yeah, so the whole point is, again, that communication and especially for school kids, it's all right if you have problems at home. Yeah. But it's a way of saying, okay, how can you bring yourself into this or do a drawing about it or, yeah. you know, that's, that's it. Key, that for me is the key bit where it really links to a lot of the kind of spiritual practices I do in meditation because there is a fear about going to difficult places yeah yeah in themselves. and we want everything especially you know our British people I find you know this onwards and upwards kind of you know there's not a real it's not real and no. I find that and I think a lot of artists find that kind of really uncomfortable actually <laughs> you know um but yeah that fear of going to places that are difficult but that is life you know um, yeah yeah and um and the art is the um and that creativity is it's a platform so the more obstacles and problems you have in your life the more you've got to say because again, I think with systems, people going, oh, I need to get married, do this, do that. It's a very selfish thing. Mm. There's other people trying to do the same thing, but with the creativity and the art, you have to look at the problems because again, you're not the only one suffering, yeah. but do something about it or at least talk to someone. Yeah, open up the conversation with people. That's it. Yeah. And it's open-ended. Like mm. I said, art, there's no right or wrong answer, but you know there's someone else that you can connect with. Yeah. Collaborate with. Yeah, that is the fear I think with art sometimes and again it, it's on the macro and the micro thinking about in, in primary school classrooms the fear of what is this going to open up it's like oh no we've got to keep everything in a kind of state where we can control it and manage it <laughs> yeah that's it just in case one pupil might go oh god yeah I'm talking about this it's like well let them but that's what will come out yeah absolutely. yeah, yeah. But I don't, I'm sure you've read lots of essays on um how art changes from a three-year-old to an 18-year-old you know and, and when they're two and three years old there's no labels on anything they don't know what pond is called a pond the sky is blue so yeah. they just play and paint on walls and do all sorts of things as soon as they go into school the teacher goes what what is it mm. and the parents go what is it if it's if I know what it is it can be on the fridge mm. and suddenly kids start putting labels on things and, and I think that's where it comes from suddenly it has to be something yeah it goes into that system they so they lose their imagination mm. so when it's a teenager um preparing for gcse is going all oh, right i have to do everything right the wine bottle needs to look like wine bottle the bowl of fruits needs needs to look like that 
So no, so you really engage when you're asked to label something. Mm. That's when that creativity and imagination goes. Is, yeah. To do something, yeah. but sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, and sometimes you get it out there, and then you can think about the meaning. You know, that yeah. can come afterwards. Because otherwise, yeah, it's all about, again, it's about conformity, isn't it? Conformity, yeah. Just yeah. reacting to what you, reading what everybody else expects of you. Same as in life, which is why artists, I suppose, are notoriously rule breakers and yeah. you know, unconventional. Yeah, I'm not going to care what other people say. Well, you do care because you're actually saying what other people can't say. Yeah, true. And then when that work is done. Yeah. Okay, well, I've, that's my opinion. Hmm. That's why, this is, see, this is what I really want, is for primary schools to, to get more of that rebellious spirit when it's an art lesson, is to have that, you know, if nowhere else, but just in that space at that time. I think that's really difficult, especially for school teachers, because they have girls that have targets, they have to have, well, they have to follow the curriculum. Mm. Um, and just before the recession, I was doing so many um, art workshops as an artist coming in, in residence, for schools all over the country, especially um, very white schools, mm. um, and teaching artwork from um, different cultures, countries, and the kids are like, wow, have you just traveled from Japan? Because I was doing Japanese art, and they had no idea. Mm. You know, and, and that was fantastic, but there's a lot of school teachers who went, oh, well, we don't do it that way. It's like, there's a reason I'm here, not to do it your way. Because yeah. I didn't have a curriculum, I didn't have a syllabus, I didn't put on the, on the whiteboard, this is what we're gonna do today. That's, that's a real, that's, there's a benefit, isn't there, to having outside people come in Yeah. don't have to follow those rules. Yeah. And it, but then a lot of funding was cut. Yeah. And what was first, 25% in arts cuts in um, 2008. Mm. And I lost a lot of work from that, which is such a shame because I was getting through to them and the teachers. Mm. And the teachers, exactly. It's yeah. empowering for the teachers. And yeah. you know, teaching, primary school teaching, I just don't know. I've only ever taught just art. I've been really lucky to teach in state schools to teach just art part-time which is amazing but oh, I really? never do the job of a primary school teacher because they do so much it's insane and to then you know I get that sometimes it must be a bit irritating to have people like me or the Tate going Tate going just do this you know and yeah. they're going yeah but when or <laughs> how you know <laughs> yeah yeah um, and then they kept it very in-house mm. you know but teachers um again so much admiration for them because I haven't got time to actually spend a whole evening or a day going oh I'm gonna let myself go because I'm marking all the time yeah you know yeah. they got the pressures from the head grades everything that's why there is a responsibility on people like us I mean galleries and museums yeah. to, to enhance and to support in that way yeah but it's always at the bottom of the list mm. you know there's so many educational resources um like I said, I'm in Nottingham, Nottingham Contemporary, so much educational resources and you can bring your um, students in for free. Mm. Um, but again, it's on the bottom of the list because the government are saying it needs to be science, maths and English. We don't want to be seen as a country that can't read or do sums. Even though when you look at the creative industries in our country, they are thriving and... Yeah, they are thriving. It's one of the sectors that will not go down. Yeah completely insane isn't it i just don't understand how um well certain hierarchies just don't get like I said that connectivity between the subjects i almost want to go into you know get a load of these sort of suits and just get them to do so you need to get them to do some creating and do some art it'd be great to be able to go into parliament and just sort of oh take... yeah 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 that's what we're doing with lots of businesses and they look at me going oh what's she going to go on about now and then by the end of two hours they are just getting their hands dirty and oh. And they really quiet and just making like things like paper airplanes where they put notes on it. Does doesn't it feel to be good? Yeah, <laughs> to just play and get and reconnect with that and that you know it is it's that this is why art is so much more because it's about how do you want to live your life? How do you yeah. want to feel as a human being on this earth? Do you want to feel just like a robot or? feel alive you know yeah, if you've got something to moan about do something about it yeah yeah that's been a bit of my mantra well I'm not going to sit there I'm quite lucky to have the arts and and mm. not giving up on it mm. and yes I'm doing loads of online things and marketing what have you but I'll get that done during the day and then the afternoon is like oh I can do my art I was just gonna ask how do you manage your time because I yeah do you write a schedule out or 
I have a very long to-do list <laughs> day by day, but prioritize. Yeah. So I get menial jobs out of the way. Um, get the things where you have deadlines, get those out of the way. Yeah. And then I can have my free time, which is about my artwork. And like I said, you know, one day I can have five Zoom, five Zoom meetings, mm -hmm. get them all done in one day, and then tomorrow is my day, whether I'm sat in the garden reading or whether I'm doing my artwork, mm -hmm. or whether it's sewing up clothes. Yeah. Leave it for ages. And there needs to be a balance. But um, yeah, I'm very, very busy. But I have to say to myself, it's all right to have a rubbish day. Mm -hmm. Not too much. Mm -hmm. That has to be done. You can't keep doing that. No, it's interesting this time, isn't it? Because I think... I, I still feel busy. I think a lot of it's because I, I just have all these little projects and like this is one of the projects that I've had on my mind for ages and if it wasn't for lockdown, I probably wouldn't have started. Yeah, because yeah, we contacted each other ages ago, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, I was, oh, that okay. school in Brixton was heartbreaking. I mean, oh. that's a whole, nother, a whole nother issue, but I mean, that's the short, you know, I started that job having only taught part-time art for a long time and then I took that on as a full-time art teaching job because I thought this is great it's a new school in Brixton um, I'm going to be the head of department there I can really make a difference and I lasted about six months because the school and don't blame you yeah. don't blame you have all I mean as artists again as a creative person you have all these ideas mm. not just ideas but how to actually implement them and make changes and then there's management that go, oh, well, it doesn't really fit with our policy. And you just think, oh, what have I put this energy in for? Yeah. Take it somewhere else. Exactly. And it was hard because I had, you know, when I joined, it was the year, year nines were just choosing their GCSEs and hardly any of them had chosen art. And I managed to get the uptake for art oh. up. But then I left and I did, you know, I, I struggled emotionally with that because I felt like I was letting the kids down. But sometimes you just have to just, yeah. What feels right. <laughs> so much to give. Take it somewhere else where people will listen. Yeah. And also because you do feel alone. Yeah. You know, like being made done. It's like yeah. I had to go without a fight, and it's like, come on, I'm not the only person here. You feel like a one-woman show, don't you? Just yeah, yeah. <laughs> people want to keep their jobs, so they keep their mouth shut. Yes, exactly. But this is the thing, and you know, this this is the world we live in, where there are so many people who do just want to conform. It's the fear of change, the fear of speaking out. Fear of um, not making money. Fear of not making money. Where do you get that from? Because I get, my mum is, is a lot like that. Like I, my family are Guyanese, so we're Indo-Guyanese. Right. So, but people often, especially in the 80s when I was growing up, would assume that I came from a very strict Indian family and I didn't, my mum was. Neither did I. Everyone go, oh, it must have been hard for you. Actually, yeah. it must have been hard. <laughs> Well, my dad came to this country from Bangladesh when he was 12 in the 1950s, and we didn't have much money at all. But he always said to me, if you want something, you graft. Mm. You work your ass off, basically, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> you nice. Work, you know, and he made it from nothing to everything. And it's like, yeah, actually, I'm not going to sit there. And what really annoyed me was artists going, I can't make any work because I haven't got funding. Mm. Oh, come on. And that's why I got into curating, which I don't get paid for. You know, I, I work the rest of the year to save money to actually pay for things. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, the whole making money, yeah, it's quite a typical Asian family thing because they can tell their relatives going, oh, look, she's this, she's that. So when I got the TV stuff, my mum was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Otherwise, they don't get it. Yeah, is that um, the reputation of the family? Yeah, yeah. See, my, see, no, my my mum's not like that, but she she was she's very like outspoken and very like a maverick. So you know, she would send me into school with like the weirdest clothes and just be like, just like it was almost in the same way that some parents are like, be normal. She was like, be different in this. Excellent. Way. My dad was like that. <laughs> my dad was like, when we used to have mosque open days, girls weren't allowed in. My dad used to get me in all the time, do speeches and things. <laughs> Brilliant. It was brilliant. Yeah, he was a massive big rule breaker and very forward thinking. So that's interesting because a lot, a few of the artists I've been speaking to grew up with like artist parents, which I don't know at all. No, no, not at all. I think that again, it was something inside me. It's something that I could hang on to. Mm. Um, and my dad always supported me, saying, "Okay, if you really love this stuff. Go and do it. I have no idea how you're going to do it, so I can't support you." But go and do what you love. Yeah. And you that's know. the artist spirit, isn't it? So yeah. whether or not you grow up with actual art in the house being made, that is 
the, the spirit is something that can come through as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know about your background, but it was, okay, I'll get married off and have kids by the time I'm this age. It's like, I'm not doing it. No. You weren't happy because you have to respect both cultures. Mm. Um, but in the end, someone said to me, you actually look at to have two cultures. I went, yeah, actually, I'm going to see it like that rather than being teenage about it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, and again, coming back to the school thing it is, you know, one of the other reasons why I love seeing you on TV is because I know when I was growing up, I didn't see any brown women doing art. Like, I would just wouldn't have known that it was a thing that was possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't like to think of it like that, but a lot of people, especially Asian supporters, are going, wow, it's great to see you on TV. Is, that, is it because yeah. I'm a good artist? But no, because you're brown. <laughs> There's something that, there is something, there is something about it. But from the other side, I do, it is so important. That school in Brixton that I taught in, I remember one of the year nine girls, when I said to to them so why has no one chosen art like it's fine that you haven't but just talk to me about why what's going on and she said to me oh because black people can't be artists this was like a couple of years ago in Brixton it's like what's what's going well, on that's it. yeah when I work in um a predominantly uh, white schools I'm going I need to work in um other state schools and I have done mm -hmm. and again those are kids and parents going it's so good to see you on tv for my kids good on you as I was like, thank you you know, and because that's another layer of it. Yeah, yeah. you can promote your right, you can have that voice of communication, but who are you on the outside yeah. to represent people? Yeah. I think that is so important, but you don't get many. Like yeah. I said, you know. And if you do, it's a massive big issue, or they're on TV because of this, or they get interviewed because of this. Yeah. And it is a tricky yeah. one. It is a, a tricky one, because obviously, like you say, and I remember like with the Frank Bowling exhibition, um, there was so much talk around that and about him being seen as a black artist or not wanting to be, you know, identified as just a black artist. So it is quite, and I get that because he's an amazing artist, you know. Yeah. But do you, do you feel like a slight sense of responsibility in that way? Or I, I do. Um, I remember um, at university, a lot of lecturers go, oh, do you work on your culture? I went, I'm not interested. Culture is my, that's what I do daily. Yeah. Art is almost the least where I want to talk about worldwide issues, not just of my culture of a person of colour, if you like. Yeah. Yeah, that's always there, but I try to not, I mean, I'm trying not to victimise myself because that mm -hmm. is a horrible word to use. We shouldn't. We no, shouldn't. Absolutely. I mean, you wouldn't go to a Caucasian person, oh, you're a white artist. You would never hear that. You can make some work about your culture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I work for Nottingham Women's Centre, I'm on the board um, for there, and we have lots of um, BAME women coming in, um, but they want to be clearly identified as BAME. It's like, why? You're a woman. But then why just be a woman? You're a human being. Yeah. So a label within a label within a label, and before you even know your skill or what you're good at, it's just label after label. And it's pressure then, isn't it? It's, it's a bit of pressure to represent yourself uh, in a certain way whereas maybe like you say maybe that's not what's inside and needs to come out it just is that's how I exist yeah as in yeah I and inevitably when you create work it comes from whoever you are whether that is a brown woman or a black man or whatever yeah you sort of labor labor the point I guess yeah you don't just make work because of where you're from because that'll just be too easy mm. You know, yeah. for the sake of funding or job applications where you do the ethnicity form. Yeah. Um, do you manipulate your job application to go, I am a Bengali British artist because I know they'll read that and go, oh, maybe I'll get the funding. Or No, <laughs> it shouldn't be like that. Exploring issues to do with my cultural identity and yeah. heritage. <laughs> when I first started, it was all about that. It's like, actually, no, I want people to... I, recognize me for the skill or the job that I'm going for mm. and it like we said it does come in I definitely still you know I still do bits of work because it's about processing your life isn't it and that those things will come up um, oh yeah absolutely and and talk about um school kids that is part of their home life you know they're, they're relying on their parents and that is their culture their heritage yeah like you're Polish Asian Caucasian Mm. That still needs to come in because they need to develop that voice going, actually, I come from here, but mm. I don't always have to go on about it. Mm. But I know this is me. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, again, like everything, it's a balance, isn't it? It's a balancing act of yeah. being aware, being informed, owning it, but not using it as a kind of thing, as a thing to kind of bond with people with or do things with. It's, yeah, 
Yeah, and, then, and again, it, it could be seen, seen as um, problematic, but again, because there's tension there, mm. that's what makes the artwork. Like yeah. I was saying, you know, it's problems and obstacles that drive you. Because yeah. Yeah. we are problem solvers as well, as artists. Yeah. Absolutely. Going on the world. No one else is going to say it, but we are. Yeah, absolutely. And sensitive to, to the environment. And we're there as kind of like, almost that like antenna, uh, just picking up on things and processing what's going on. Yeah, and I think it's important that artists always take a minute and slow down with, without rushing through. We always see the unnoticed. Mm. You know, you can always see an artist walking down the street and looking at a crack in the floor going, oh my God, that's so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody else would do that. <laughs> Which is partly, again, why the lockdown is good for arts, because we're slowing down. Yeah. I mean, the first couple of weeks, I had email after email of work being cancelled. I went, how are we going to do this? Um, but now we've got much more work, but it has made me just slow down and reflect, going, actually, what have I done? What yeah. have I got? And it's been really nice to reflect on that. Mm. And think about what's important. Like you said, it's no, not everything. Obviously, we need money to live, but not thinking about always monetizing things, but just mm. what do I want to do? What feels important for me to do right now? Yeah. Uh, I just... Yeah. How what, do you reach out to people? And a lot of my work is about correspondence and collaboration, connectivity mm. with different artists and through the curated. And we have fantastic technology and it is about slowing down and reconnecting with people mm. when you are going for proposals or when you are asking for an exhibition going back to those emails and going actually did you think about it and they go actually yeah like you for example perfect example because of lockdown I went do you remember me yeah, yeah. Project, perfect example yeah. and there's that's there's a quality to that and I just hope 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 that that can we can keep that as people when when things start returning to normal I actually you know I've been speaking to a lot of friends about how this slight anxiety about things going back to normal mm. because, you know yeah I think there is anxiety because I, I've got a routine now you know I'm doing yeah. like hours of artwork and I'm thinking do I need to get up at seven and get on a train for two hours to go teach like oh <laughs> thought of it the yeah, I think it's a, a great thing in a very selfish way to actually, yeah, slow down. But yeah. I hope people have slowed down. Yeah. You know, I know, you know aside from money and um, supporting family, mentally, I think people needed this. I just hope we'll remember it. Do you have any other practices that you do to sort of look after yourself? Obviously, creating is a big part of helping you feel like you. Are there any other practices that you have? I'm a massive big um, aerobics class goer but obviously the gyms have shut but my sister's a yoga teacher oh cool Pilates, so she's moved her business online now so i'm with her oh, that's almost cool. every day going right okay and i'm not so i'm more cardio but she's more breathing but yeah. she's taught me how to breathe and take a minute which has been really good otherwise i've never done a classes in 20 years now it's just going okay so that's another really nice thing yeah it's so nice for her when she looks to see your little face on the screen there it must be <laughs> Yeah, so there's a nice connection there. Um, like I said, I've never done her classes, but she has taught me just to slow down and breathe for a minute. Absolutely. And the amount of books that we're reading, it's great. Yeah. You know, even queuing up outside supermarkets, I can see people just reading. Yeah. You never get that. Patting to each other. And yeah, there are definitely lots and lots of positives. And yeah, I just, I would definitely want to, I hope these videos and I hope that, you know, all the work we're all doing is really going to feed into how things unfold. Absolutely, I think, um, I mean, the one with um, Bob Rupert Smith, I mean, that was great. Mm. Just chatting and going, okay, this is, I mean, yeah. everyone sees him as a big artist, he's so down to earth. So, um, and you the projects I'm doing for AN. Yeah. It's great. But all of you, it's just, it's so generous people to give their time to talk like this about, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's I, the, the three main core topics for me are, learning about your history and how you got into art, the, the art and education, but and the well-being. And it just seems those things are so organically linked and the conversation I've been having are, you know, just selfishly for myself, I'm just like loving chatting to people. Oh, no, it's a great project, really is. Um, I mean, the whole thing about um, just going back, um, why can't you be an artist? Because we don't get paid enough. Yes, you can if you advocate for it. I just want to put that out there. Yeah. You know, you don't get um, someone in the bakery baking everything and then just selling for no money. We make art, we have an exhibition, and again, the AN artists um, 
council and artists being paid is a huge, huge policy now in this country, well, in England. Um, you know, the fact that we can ask for our price, I think it's a really quite independent way to be. Yeah, and it's an interesting one, again, that has come up a few times in the chat, is that thing of, you know, valuing yourself and being... Value. Yeah, and asking for what you deserve. Mm. Yeah, it can be tricky to talk about money, but you have to value yourself. Why do you do what you do? Why do you want to share something? Any other occupation, you want to do it for free. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a tricky yeah. one. And that's, you know, again, talking about how much content could be in art education. That's another element that could be included in, you know, in a well-rounded art education. Well, Self-promotion we've, we've aspect. Covered so we covered loads of things, that all the things that I wanted to cover and more. Um, so thank you so much. It's so oh, you're welcome. No, it's been really good to chat. Sometimes you know we are in isolation and you work on your laptop, so it's good to just go. Ah, there's someone out there. I love it. It's great. And you know, I'm living. I'm living with my. Okay, we didn't really get to talk that much about your actual projects, your personal artwork, and what you're doing at the minute. I don't know if you want. Um, well, I've started off projects that I did ten years ago. So, so one of the projects is called Distant Dialogues, where um, I basically, and it was being an artist on my own and going, okay, that whole thing, I can't be the only person there. And it was like a Lonely Hearts column, reaching out to people. So I decided to send um, a letter for anyone that I knew around the world mm -hmm. to put up on a lamppost or a post office queue, have a correspondence with me for one year. And I didn't actually get real people. I got loads of junk mail. So things like somewhere from um, Alaskan Brown Bear Sanctuary that said, do you want to join our sanctuary? Dear Alaskan vacationer, lawn mowers that have been sent from India. <laughs> so junk mail. So I'm going to stick to my own rules. And I wrote back to them as though they were lovers. I go, okay, you wrote to me. And it's been 10 years since I did that. So I'm going, I've not heard from you for 10 years. So that. It's a Lonely Hearts column that never got answered. So I love that connectivity, but also not being recognised because rejection is still being recognised. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, oh, that's I've just bought an old typewriter that I'm just doing. No oh, screen. that sounds so good. I did see the Alaskan Bear letters actually on your website and I did think <laughs> that's brilliant. It's so good. Oh, okay. Yeah, so correspondence, you know, everyone's into writing letters at the moment, which is yeah. great. Yeah. It's too easy. Yeah. Where that envelope will go. Absolutely, yeah. I keep meaning to, but I've got to post a birthday gift to a friend. And don't you find, like, now, like, that one activity of posting a letter, where I would have done that in amongst 50 other things, now I'm like, which day shall I go to post that letter? <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing, because that's still, to do, yeah, I mean, my to-do list, uh, do, you know, the menial, most menial jobs, I cross it off, done it, sense of achievement at the end of the day. Definitely, yeah. Absolutely. Get up, brush teeth, done. Yeah, <laughs> earrings on, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Okay. You always look so well done. I've put makeup on for you. <laughs> I, I, you look great. I'm loving those earrings. <laughs> oh, earrings. Always wear earrings just so you don't feel like you're in your pyjamas all yeah, the time. Yeah, yeah. Although my, uh, my years of dangly earrings might be coming to an end because I'm getting that awful, like, hat butcher. <laughs> yeah. My mum's got that from wearing golden jewellery. I might have to move up to some of the other holes, you know, teenage <laughs> piercings. <laughs> but yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you, Diana. Take yeah, care. any time for a chat. Enjoy the sun. I will do. Yeah, just looking out my window. It's nice. Yeah. All right. See Thanks, you. Thanks, Emily. Take care. Bye-bye.